this cover. Mm -hmm. um, I just rem reminded myself to turn on the record button. Because I saw it, worked out. Good. Okay, good, good. Um, I'm waiting for my friend Linda Brooks to actually. Oh, I see her up present. top. Is, is she personally there? No, just her name. Okay, okay. Linda and I just worked on a book together, which is kind of a, a interesting parallel to what you've been doing. Um, oh, nice. John Olson's coming, Linda Brooks is here. Hi, John. Hi, John. Oh, we have two, a couple of people on mute. Hello, George. Hi, John. This Good is you. This is Tim. Say hi to Tim. Hey, hey, Tim. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Good to meet you. Good John, you. where where are you today? What what space is that you're purporting to put us in? Oh, uh, this is just my studio at home. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh. Uh, in Coquito, Minnesota, they have this old, uh, old uh, photo studio. Yes, and, yes. Uh, th this was a shot from inside of that old studio, and I just took it and used it as the background. So. Right. What's the photographer's name? Gus something. Gus. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm really bad with names, so um, I, it's Gus something, and I can't remember. Right, but they, they, it's sort of a historic house that was a photo studio. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you can actually go in there for 25 bucks and, and rent the studio. It's got north light, big glass wall, and it's mm -hmm. kind of cool. <laughs> and, and a painted backdrop like the one you're sitting in front of. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the old Victorian chairs. And <laughs> mm -hmm. Do they have headrests for the, uh, you know, to hold your head in place? The clamp? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is it really? Yes, he does. Yeah. And, and the camera he's got there doesn't have a shutter. It's just you put your hand in front of the lens. <laughs> oh, my that's God. It. Yeah. That's, that's a handmade photograph, to be sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think they also have uh, the old dark room that's in there with some of the boxes from the old chemicals. And it's quite unique. Mm -hmm. does, it, does it still smell like chemicals? <laughs> uh it you know strangely enough it does <laughs> i don't know if uh, they never go away acetic acid kind of permeates things <laughs> um, so what have you been doing john have you been busy photographing yeah well you know i photograph rodeos and there was uh four days of rodeos that uh, i just got through with so wow um, i <laughs> i was pretty wasted at the end of it because it was uh it was hot and <laughs> you uh you had to kind of struggle to get the spot you really wanted to to, to get a good angle without getting in front of the spectators were you were so, you down by down by ringside oh yeah yeah yeah, I uh, had the opportunity to look the bulls in the eyes. <laughs> Tim, have you ever photographed rodeo? No, I have a friend uh, who did it and it looked fantastic and he has a great shot. This is maybe like 15 years ago or more, a great shot of an awesome Canon L series lens just caked in mud from all the <laughs> kickback. Uh, I'm yeah. assuming that cleaned off. I don't know. Have you had that experience? Uh, sometimes, uh, not not uh, with a big lens, with a smaller lens. Like uh, I had a 50 millimeter once, and uh, mm -hmm. a horse kicked and it knocked uh, my camera into the dirt. So <laughs> it yeah. didn't hurt the camera, but it hurt the lens. So. <laughs> um, hey, Linda. I'm sitting back and listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we may have a we may have a small group, so it may be it may be a discussion group tonight. Oh well, okay. I was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. You look great. No problem. Well, it's, it's, we I just came off of a big weekend with the company and from out of town and a lot of stuff well, on last week, so I'm 
and I oh. had Quincy, and I had Quincy today. So oh, Quincy is is Linda's. Uh, how old? Three years old now. Yeah. Four yeah. years oh, old. Wow. Brand wow. brand son. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a handful. He's a character. He is. Yes. Today he took. We were looking at rocks from Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. Those rocks, and. I'm not facing him, and he goes over to this antique vase that's oh, it's like three feet high at least from my great my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Rock, and he drops it inside this ceramic vase. It's very ornate, kind of like Art Nouveau looking. <laughs> Luckily, I don't think anything's cracked. I tried to scoop it out with a pair of tongs, and it's <laughs> oh. Thank you, grandchild. Another gentle way to get it out of there without cracking it myself. So, can, you, can you chip it? Or well, I, I don't, I'm afraid because there's so much fragile stuff at the top edge. You know, it's got all those grapes and the birds on top. Right, right. You don't want it to come out and break that stuff. So right. I, it, it may stay in there forever. Well, <laughs> Linda, Linda, you may know John from the Twin Cities. Do you know John Olson? I'm not sure. Do we meet at some TC photo thing or? Um, not, it might have been at, at George's house that one time oh, uh, yeah. a couple there of years was, ago. Yeah. yeah, we had that that summer event. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You were both there. Um, yeah. Linda, this is Tim Soder. Tim is joining us from Brooklyn. Hi. Good to see you. Hello. Hi. Yes. I was, I'm a Brooklynite. Oh, right on. Where in Brooklyn? King's Highway near Nostrand Avenue. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, have you lived there all your life? No, I grew up in uh, very rurally in a log cabin in Pennsylvania, and then oh. moved here right after college and just never left. So I've been here, I think, 27 years maybe. Um, so right now I'm, I've been in Greenpoint in Brooklyn for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, it's nice. I was showing the view earlier of the park, which is nice to live on a park, which is a lucky break in New York City. Yeah. Um, but it's it's pretty nice Polish neighborhood over here. Good pierogies. Mm -hmm. uh, All can't right. Complain. <laughs> what did I just see? Yeah, we, we moved up to Long Island, Nassau. What was that, Linda? My grandparents still lived in Brooklyn. Well, I lived on Long Island too, but my grandparents stayed in Brooklyn, so I was there a lot growing up. Mm -hmm. um, well, Tim, Tim has done. I was just telling Tim that that you and I, Linda, have just finished a book project, um, and it could be really, uh, really interesting for us to talk a little bit about how our book project and Tim's book projects um, have some things in common both in terms of uh, like deep dives into someone's career um, and yours being much more uh, generated from, from your angle and Tim's being generated from a combination of angles. There are three books of yours, Tim, that, that we wanna look at. Um, and one of which is kind of a, a correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the book with Dwayne Michaels is something of a fanboy uh, yeah, stalkerish. Uh, people have said in that fashion. <laughs> stalkerish, right? Yeah. And so, and and then the, the second book is a a, a more uh, interactive piece with, with Arthur Tress. Um, Linda, you may know Arthur Tress. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. John, do, are you John? Are you familiar with Arthur Tress's work? J just the name, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you will you will learn something about Arthur Tress uh, through through Tim's uh, presentation, and then the last the last book, well, sort of the last book, almost the last book, most recent book, um, is uh, Tim's own book of, of his own photographs called Environments, and it'll be it's interesting because they're well the the discussion about books is always what I want to have here. Um, and, and Tim and I have talked a little bit about, about the handmade qualities of his books and how, um, how there's, there's how, the, how so often these days there's, there's the greatest hits mentality. I think you brought this up, Tim. That was really something that stuck with me, um, where, 
you know, someone has the desire, well, you can describe a greatest hits book, Tim, better than I can. I said that uh, when we were talking earlier, I said the greatest, I was raised on the greatest hits mentality when making a book. You know, everyone, to me, everyone does well when they have a criteria when you're making a photo book. And that's a good place to start and use as a sounding board as you're constantly changing things, making things, adapting, something doesn't work out, you're frustrated in the middle of it, you're not sure if it can be a book. You just keep going back to the criteria. So the books that I was raised on as a student who got turned on to photography in college in the early 90s um, were people like Dwayne Michaels or Arthur Tress or Joel Peter Whitkin, um, people like that. I'm trying to think of who else would have been in that canon. Bruce Davidson, Gary Winogrand. So the books that I'd seen that were photo books were almost, almost always monographs. And the monographs were greatest hits. So the thing that I was raised on was like, you can have a book once you've got enough greatest hits. You can't release an album that's got like two radio friendly songs and then some filler and then one deep cut that some people might connect with. That's not a book, you know, like it's got to be a greatest hit. So I've used what that was, as the. Yeah. What was the first book that broke the mold? Broke the mold, like the first book I saw or that went against that kind of. That went against that. I mean, that, that um, pushed against that for you. Yeah. It wasn't the greatest hits. Um, or what, what inspired you to, to go down the line of uh, stalking Dwayne Michaels? You know, the, yeah, the, the, I don't know that there was a book that I saw that you know, went against the greatest hits mold that I enjoyed. I'm sure there was, but it came down to like, am I really gonna live with this thing? You know, I've got a lot of books here. Am I really gonna live with this thing? It has to be a book that you look at over and over again. So most of them kind of had to stand up to the greatest hits test, or I've refined that to what I call the spine test. You know, when I'm making a book, it's got to pass the spine test. And the spine test is, um, if you make a book and somebody buys it and they put it on their bookshelf with all of their other art books, photo books and stuff, if they look at that book three years from now or six years from now and they see the spine, do they say, oh, I, I really haven't, that's a, that's a good book. I really haven't looked at that in a while. Do they pull it off the shelf? Like that's the spine test. I'm not saying all my books can pass the spine test, but that's at least the criteria or the bar that I'm trying to hit. Here, here are, are two of Tim's spines. Uh, they're not even recognizable. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, hopefully you, you can tell what that is, uh, you know, from that thin font. Right. Um, Tim, yeah, you're, you're learning here. I'm, I'm doing a demonstration. It's perfect. You know, will, you know, will I, Tim's book pass the spine test 20 years from now? I will say that um, uh, noted photographer Alex Soth was uh, doing a, a, a podcast or like a, a Zoom or a, it was a YouTube video. It's a YouTube video. And um, he was there with a microphone set up like this, talking to an audience. His whole bookcase was behind him. And he had bought a copy of Fortress uh, about two years ago at a fair. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if I could see it. And I took a screenshot of him and I zoomed into it and it was right about here over his shoulder. It happened right. out of that whole collection. It was not only there, but in frame in the sh shots, which was amazing. So. And, and I could sharp, recognize the spine. I felt pretty sharply good. enough, sharply enough focused. But it's you know it's got a nice gray quality to it. Um, I can recognize it. You know maybe the next one I'll make it uh, like um, caution tape kind of color so it'll really leap out. People want to take it off the off now, the shelf more often. I would love to show these guys a little bit. I, I'm assuming that neither of you have seen either or any of Tim's books. Is that fair to say? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I could talk about the Dwayne Michaels book and uh, share my screen. I think uh, I think I have um, a PDF of that. Yes, I do that I could share if you want to do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do okay, that. Okay, good. Let me... Um, I, I'm curious about the next test of the book and, and how worn the spine might be 
giving a signal as to, you know, somebody's always taking it out and looking at it. You know? well, well, that's tough too, because now people are precious with their books because, or some yeah. people are, because they realize like, oh, these things could be quite valuable at some point. You know, yeah. I wish I'd been more careful with a lot of my books, but um, yeah, some have some slight uh, love issues. You know, they were, like you said, <laughs> gently loved. Um, but honestly, now I don't collect so many collector's books or that type of thing because I want something like I can just quickly reference, you know, like I want it because if I buy one that's cheaper because it's used and it's, it's you know, been around the block, that just means I have more capital to buy some other books with that. So I'm not as hey. precious. Hey, Linda, do you have a copy of Proximities there that we could look at the, the spine, check the spine test on Proximities? <laughs> And Tim, Tim and John, you can, John, you may have seen Linda's book. Anyway, um, you can get a quick glimpse, glimpse, glam, glance. Glance <laughs> is good. That's a good one. Yeah. So I just, just want to say when you're talking about spines, with all these newscasters doing virtual broadcasts from their homes, have you noticed the way they've I've tried to identify the books on their shelves? And mm -hmm. I first realized the color coding method of filing books by David Brooks. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, right, right. Power. Has anybody been attuned to that kind of spine reading? Oh, sure. <laughs> or there are whole Instagram accounts that are for um, uh, devoted to art that people have discovered over, you know, people's shoulders and trying to identify oh, yeah. what pieces they are. And stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that spine is nice and legible. I can actually read the title clearly. Yeah, uh, and the and the sort of subtitle, it sets up a rhythm on the spine. It's not as easy to read, and then the the, the front. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, nice. Huh. And the front is the front is exceedingly simple until you read. If you can read the button, it says defiant. Oh, nice. Oh, it's yeah. Handmade, it's a hand beaded button my grandmother made. Probably. Oh wow. Oh, what yeah. a great idea. That is great. And this is from a, um, a Women's Caucus Action of SPE, Society for Photographic Education. Oh, yeah, yeah. In yeah, response yeah. to all the mail we were getting in the 80s was about um, exhibitions and publications and collections and museum shows of, of who was exhibiting. And they were like 90% men. So we we saved the mail and did an installation of the, that mail with, um, uh, with the remaining women set, left in the publication, the flyers, so that mm -hmm. you can see how uh, underrepresented women and people of color look. So yeah. Linda, Linda is, a, is, a, is a subversive. Um, uh, look, it's amazing. <laughs> I was at the opening of the Whitney and was amazed that the Gorilla Girls were still going, showing up with the gorilla mask and stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the, the problem is still there, Tim, I think. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'm going to share if you will. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Oh, I probably need to give you permission. That's okay. true. God, should I ask for permission or is it no, already? I, it's think I, I think I've given it to you now. That's kind. I'll take it. All right. Go for uh, it. Here we are. Okay, let's see, get a full screen. Da, da, da. I was just reading a little bit about where the title came from, and I hope you can give us a little bit. Of uh, that. Totally. So um, the story with this book is that um, I had learned about Dwayne Michael's work when I was a student, you know, like I said, early 90s, and had really enjoyed it then, but it subtly kind of moved on to other photography or other photographers over the years and then at some point maybe about 10 years ago he popped back into my mind and I thought oh I really like that work so um, I started buying up his books um, which were for the most part pretty pretty accessible or affordable um, based on if you were getting um, a uh, a new copy or you know a used gently used copy or a not so gently used copy that's what I was um, that's what I was uh, going for so I could acquire these books uh, this is a passage that says one day in 2000, I was walking home to where I lived 
And I passed by this guy and I said, uh, excuse me, are, are you Dwayne Michaels? I had recognized him, this old guy is just walking in. And he said, oh, I used to be. And I was like, oh, that, that, that definitely is Dwayne. That is his kind of <laughs> sense of humor. So this is a picture of uh, Gramercy Park um, where he lives, he lives over in Gramercy. So um, I had seen uh, a video on YouTube where he was interviewed and I thought uh, I was watching it and it just said, there was, a, there was a panel of this, a still image that went along with the interview. And it just said East 19th Street. They had cut off the 109, cropped that out, and just said East 19th Street with this buzzer. So one day I decided, oh, I, I'd really actually like to talk to him, but I don't know where he lives or anything. I just know it's East 19th Street. So I walked the length of 19th Street, looking at everybody's front doors from the sidewalk, trying to remember what it looked mm -hmm. like in my mind from that video. And occasionally I'd go up and kind of see, and then his name wasn't there. And at the very end of East 19th Street at Park Avenue, I finally found it. So um, I took this picture, uh, as it says, I took this picture on the stoop and then I ran away before I was caught. But um, now I had his address. And so I thought, oh, you know what, if I wanna meet him, I'm just gonna write him a letter. So I ended up writing him this letter. And the reason why I used this, this letterhead was because I had carried around this uh, Dwayne Michaels quote uh, that I'd laminated and put in my wallet. And uh, it says, um, do it. You have two choices in life, doing and bullshit. I hate photographers who talk about photography but never take any. The only way you're ever gonna grow, uh, one, you have to take risks. You have to be able to get, you have to be able to let go of all the preconceived notions of what photography should be and open yourself up to the possibilities. Otherwise, you're going to be spinning your wheels for the rest of your life. And I thought, that's pretty good advice. You know, like do it or shut up is basically the advice and, you know, let's go for it. So I wrote him this letter that basically said, hey, I'd love the opportunity to come and talk to you. You know, it would mean a lot to me and, and I carry this quote in my wallet. So- Wait, Oh, hang on, Tim. I sure. see right away there's something, there's a reference to Arthur. Uh, I think because I had talked to Arthur and I knew they were friends and I had met Arthur just a hint before writing this letter and Arthur said, um, oh, you know, maybe you should talk to Dwayne or if you talk to Dwayne, mention me or something like that. Arthur was kind of supportive. So uh -huh. yeah, I actually met Arthur like a little bit earlier. By the mm -hmm. way, I can't go back and read these letters. It's, I, I'm not even this person anymore. It's like, I know it's only 10 years ago now, but I'm just not that person. And it's, you know, like I didn't necessarily want to share these in the first place, the, the letters that are in the book, but that's where the interesting bits are. You know, it helps document me and where my head was that in my, that at that point in my life, but also like everybody wants to know all the secret things you wouldn't normally share with people. <laughs> like that's the interesting mm -hmm. stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Does sure. Does your handwriting resemble Dwayne Michael's handwriting in some of his books? Or is his, it his handwriting is a little more scrawly and he usually uses like a quill that's dipped. I mean, I like his varied, and we will look at that in this book, his distinct handwriting. But my handwriting has kind of always looked like this. You'll see other examples where I like kind of individually drawing each letter quickly is kind of what my handwriting ends up being the way I, I write. So he responds to this letter and he says, um, hey, you can come and meet me. It's right around before uh, the holidays, before Christmas, I think it was. He's like, hey, come on over. You know, can you come here? It's, you know, give me a call. Here's my number. He left a voicemail. We'll meet up. So I call the number. I call the number. No answer for two days. And now I'm like, well, what am I going to do? It's before Christmas. You know, maybe, um, maybe this isn't going to work out. You know, or it's too much time. It's going to pass. So I decided to write him a postcard and slip it in the mail slot because I didn't know what else to do. It mm -hmm. seemed even more stalkerish, but I'm like, yeah, what, what does it matter? He got it. He gave me another call. He said, look, uh, my phone hasn't been working. Come over, you know, tomorrow at, you know, I don't know, three o'clock. So that day I went over. Uh, um, we had a nice talk for about an hour and a half, I think. And um, yeah, it was a good good chat. We just sat down and asked him about life and death and all these questions I had or specific photos and things like that. And then at some point he said, what time is it? And I said, oh, it's 4.45. He's like, oh, you've got to go, you've got to go. 
I said, okay. I said, would you mind signing a book or two? I just brought maybe like two or three books to sign. He said, okay. And he grabbed the first one and he just wrote, Tim, go away, Dwayne Michaels. <laughs> handed it back to me. So um, I had included this spread in this book back when it was a dummy copy. And um, it wasn't until later when I was showing it to people, but it didn't really have a title uh, that people started laughing when they got to this page. So what are you, what are you laughing at? They said, oh, Tim, go away. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So that's why I chose it as the title of the book. <laughs> so the rest of the book um, are letters that I uh, had written to him. I would see him at his art openings and stuff like that. Um, here's a here's an opening he had at his gallery at DC Moore. Um, some of the conversations um, I I had with him I documented. Here's a print um, I bought uh, at the gallery, nice. um, which I love. This beautiful uh, Rene Magritte asleep print um, where he visited Rene Magritte when Dwayne was about 30, and he said Magritte would take a, a nap at lunchtime, uh, right after lunch rather, and sleep in his suit. And here's the you know, the guy who painted dreams, dreaming mm. in his suit. It was a great oh. portrait. So I bought it and then I realized that there was um, a ding in it, like a little ding kind of in the photograph when it came back to me. And it was too late to really address that with the gallery, although the, I gave them a call, but I have an obsessive personality and I couldn't let that little imperfection in the, in the print go, especially because I had paid a whole lot of money for it. So um, I went through and uh, documented, <laughs> uh, we'll get there, that ding. It's like right around here is oh, the yeah. whole ding. So uh, I ended up writing a, a thousand words about where that ding could have possibly <laughs> come from because it wasn't there when I first saw the print. I bought it. They sent it back to him for him to sign it and write on it. And it came back and, and there was the ding. So again, this book, the purpose of this book was to kind of illustrate obsession or kind of an obs uh, the way people uh, obsessively can think, especially creative people. I think it's easy for them to be obsessive. Um, and so even things like there, it is framed at different times of light in my apartment or before I bought it, I set the screensaver on my phone uh, to this image as I was considering buying it, if I was really gonna plunk down the money for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that all goes to the idea of obsession. Here was another letter and the envelope that I wrote to him. <laughs> hey, Tim, I wanted to pause there sure. just for a second. Um, the One of the treats about, about uh, certain photographers and their books is, is the fact that they do unique things with the packaging. Mm -hmm. um, and that's definitely something that I've appreciated about getting to know you and, and your, your imprint, The Ship Escaped. And, um, and then, then your books overall have that striving for uniqueness, um, individuality about them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a question in there, but it's an observation. And, it, and it's just one of, my, one of the reasons I, 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 I thought it'd be fun to talk to you um, here in this space is just to hear about, you know, how the, how the book can be a unique object at the same time it has an addition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea because I can go through this book kind of a little quicker and not spend the whole, you know, kind of uh, talk on this book, but it is nice to get to the different editions and how you can actually make something unique or special and why that's kind of a good force mm -hmm. in trying to sell something, but also right. give somebody an object that is special to them. So um, the book, again, the gist of the book is getting to know this person over time. I took a class with him out in uh, uh, Palm Springs. This Palm Springs Photo Festival. He gave like a three-day workshop. So uh, I took some pictures out there, some notes from that. You know, he's a funny oddball guy, so it lends for uh, some good photos sometimes. Right. Um, but it does, uh, it does have kind of a conclusion. You know, there's a story to this book beyond the obsession, 
Um, here are three books, uh, different copies I would buy because I couldn't stand the fact that they were so inexpensive and they're just going <laughs> to hang out on the shelves. Right. Um, more letters, more obsessing about buying multiple copies of books. Uh, getting back to um, what you had said about the handwriting, there his, there's his handwriting. And I thought a good way to kind of show obsession would be to get um, a macro lens and go in as close as I could to show and kind of fetishize um, his handwriting. There you can see where the ink has started bleeding into this paper that has a little bit of a tooth or where it's been scratched by the metal of the stylus, but no okay. ink came out, but it still left a mark on the surface. Yeah, that's incredible. So um, beyond, there's another, that's the H.I. and Michaels, but I thought it was funny to write hi, Dwayne, in this spread. <laughs> um, so again, mostly showing this kind of obsession. Um, but when we get to the kind of conclusion of the book, um, I start getting a little looser with it um, and putting in these photos, which are my photos that are a little more uh, interesting or, or a little more connected to a obsession, but on my end. Arthur uh, weighed in on this book and said, it's not about obsession. It's about you learning from someone who has a better psychological connection between themselves and their art. And I thought, well, that's a pretty heavy astute observation. So uh, the conclusion is here, me doing these kind of spiritual looking photos that, that have a kind of a, a tangential connection to the type of photography he did. This is an awesome, beautiful place in upstate New York that's an old kiln, I think. Mm. Oh, that's very Michael's. And Michael's yeah, so that's kind of how it ends. There was one pit here. This was the pivot. This is the pivotal point of this book. It says, Tim, now it's time for you to kill the Buddha. You've built me up and fetishized me through my works, my books, my words, myself. But now it's time for you to make your own path. Remember, it hasn't been done until it's been done by you. Now, that's nothing that Dwayne said. That's something that I invented that I thought he would probably say is good advice. Okay, you did all this stuff and you kind of, you know, raised me up, but kill the Buddha is an old Zen uh, master phrase, meaning, you know, let go of your heroes. Now it's time to kill the Buddha. And who are you? You know, and the one thing that Dwayne has said in teaching people is that um, it hasn't been done until it's been done by you. If right. you are not doing something and think, oh, I wish I could do nudes, but Helmut Newton did the best nudes of all time. You know, or I wish I could photograph children in this certain light, but Helen Levitt, you know, did, did the best ch children photography. It doesn't matter until you've actually done it and you've attempted right. it, you know. Right. You can't let those things get in your way. Exactly. So that was, um, that was the book. Uh, but if you'd like to hear about the, the variations, uh, I could oh. show you those. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So give me one more uh, second. Yeah, please. I'm kind of curious as to what George talked about your book being very unique and, and, and that's what attracts George to a lot of books. In the process of creating your book, when do you start, does, are those decisions made as you're going along or have you planned that ahead of time or you've done everything and you go back and go, I gotta make this unique. So, I think it's it's always like while I'm making it mm -hmm. and I would say now I enjoy making the book more than I enjoy taking photographs. Well, Tim, you might jump ahead, you know, just quickly to uh, talk about how you bring that strategy to bear in the environments book, mm -hmm. because there's a brand new version. I mean, just fresh off the press today. Um, um, it's that is true. I can. Or, I can I can get to that. I have the Dwayne stuff queued up uh, to show like how those additions were okay. special, yeah. just because it's kind of succinct. Um, let me share my screen. Um, but I appreciate that. Okay, so here we go. So for the first edition, I made fifty copies of this book. It's um, it's just 
cost effective. It's what I thought I could kind of afford. I liked the idea of a small edition of only 50 books. Um, and I knew that they would probably sell because there was al already a built in audience of people who enjoyed his work. So it had some name recognition. Mm -hmm. But what I decided to do to make each book special was um, I took my copy of one of his books right there in the center and I dismantled it, took it all apart. I took every page and I put, um, I think I have a good copy of it here. I put it on this, this um, archival uh, tacky paper down there. So peel it off, you stick that to it, it sticks to that, and then it becomes an archival sticker basically. Mm. Um, so I pressed those into, there's some copies of what it looks like. I trimmed it down. So they have the, the adhesive on the back that hasn't been pulled off yet. Um, I crimped my name into it the way you would in you know earlier days, if you wanted to mark your book collection, you'd get that little crimp stamp. I use that oftentimes instead of signing prints because it just mm -hmm. kind of fades into the print and it doesn't kind of leap out. So um, I put that in there and then I affixed it into the front page of every book. So the first edition, if you bought a copy of this first edition, you would be the only person with this copy that had this photo of uh, Marce Marcel Duchamp sitting in the window. Right. Um, or here's another copy that was part of a sequence. And I was so obsessive about this, going back to the obsessive personality, that if I knew you and you ordered a book for me, I'd go through the remaining books, maybe there are 40 books left, and look at all of them and kind of decide like, well, which one would you really like, you know, George? <laughs> like, what, what would I know you? Like, which one would kind of fit with you? Which right. was kind of a, a fun game. Um, so there's another copy uh, of the book with a different uh, imprint in there. Um, here I am uh, making it. And how often do you trip yourself up while you're doing this? Well, so how, how so? Oh, just, you know, when, when the obsession takes you down a rabbit hole that you can't get out of. All the time, um, <laughs> all the time, all the time. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll get into that with, uh, I have right along with these, um, the way that I changed the second edition and I got tripped up and I did everything to avoid doing that and still it came back to bite me. But the way that I get out of it is I bounce it off of other friends who are artists and bookmakers and they'll say, look, you're, you're on this one detail. When you see that it's not even a big deal, um, you'll be able to relax. People have talked me off a certain type of ledge all the time. And sometimes I do it for them as well. And it just kind of goes around, which is why I like doing talks and, you know, talking about ideas and things. It's helpful to bounce things off of other people. So the second edition, um, I printed up another 50 and I wanted to make the book a little different. So it wasn't exactly like the first edition. At this point, I'd gotten to know Dwayne better and started working for him, making short films with him. So I included an additional eight pages in the second edition. And here's a two page spread from that second edition where it showed some of the stills on set uh, of us making these films. I was even in one of the films here, I'm reading a book for uh, this film called The Book Crook or um, in this film, What is Real? Um, that's my kitchen, you know, we just needed a location. So um, it had an epilogue, a written epilogue that said, hey, readers, do you want to know what happened with the rest of the story? Well, and it kind of describes life after the first printing of the book. But I still wanted to make it unique in the way that I had done this idea, because I really like that. I like, I like the challenge of making something special. This is the kind of book that I would buy, you know, at a store. So I want to make it for other people. So I went to Dwayne and I said, hey, do you have a print that you would give to me? And um, I described what I was going to do with it. And he said, yeah. And I said, will you sign it? And he said, sure. And he signed it down there. And so um, I took it back with me. There is the print. And I put a grid on the back of it, one through 50. And then I cut the print apart into 50 equal sized rectangles. So it looked like this, ultimately. There are all the pieces. And then 
um, if you bought the second edition of the book, in the back of the book was a little golden envelope and you got a piece of a Dwayne Michaels print. So if it's beyond your means, you know, mm. or something like that, and your friend, you could tell your friends, oh, I actually have a Dwayne Michaels and pull <laughs> out my book and kind of fish out this little tiny print in there. And you could, um, you could have a, a Dwayne Michaels print. Oh, um, wow. I wanted to keep it fair. So what I did was um, I put all of the books, uh, I numbered them and put all the numbers in a glass jar. And that way, if you were, you know, the first, second or third person, whoever to buy this book, um, I would pull it out of a out of that glass jar and you'd get whatever piece I chose out of the jar. Because look, mm. this one's just a gray piece. I mean, that is what it is. It's just gray. Um, mm. This one down here. Uh, ignoring the breast for a second, um, has a signature, you know, like it's got his actual signature on it. So I'm assuming people would want these pieces, you know, more than like this piece. So I wanted it to be random. So what happens is um, somebody buys one, somebody buys another copy, two copies are out the door. And I was like, oh, I actually have to draw a copy for myself, you know, so I have a copy for my sh myself uh, on my bookshelf. And I pulled the number out of whatever was 48 that were remaining. And wouldn't you know it, that's the piece that I drew. I drew the piece that had his signature on it. It was insane. And the whole reason I had come up with this thing was to avoid the obsessiveness that I have and keep it random. So now I had to obsess over it. Well, should <laughs> I keep that book? I drew it. Those were my conditions and prerequisites or- Criteria. Oh, it sucks, my criteria, exactly. So I thought about it and I ended up putting that number back in there because I have enough signed things of his and things like that. I still felt like it was more fair to release it to the sea and somebody should have a chance at that, not me. So I chose another one. Good for you. I try, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, those are two ways. There's the little print outside of the golden envelope at the end, uh, two ways that I made um, the addition of that book, unique. Unique right. meaning like that copy is just your copy of both the first edition and the second edition. It's one that nobody else has. Right. They're one of a kind, but they're also part of a sequence that is mm -hmm. a logical sequence in some ways. Mm -hmm. like that book exists as an edition of 50 because that's one 50th of a Dwayne Michaels print. Mm -hmm. I was hoping somebody would buy, the, buy all 50 and try and assemble <laughs> that photo back together. Nobody right. was that bold. Right. No, that's a shame. Somebody um, might try and hunt him down. <laughs> oh, that'd be even better. Uh, yeah. They'd have to get my copy too now. I like yeah, it. Right. right. So, for, so for environments, I mean, in environments, you, you take a spin off of the, the, the uh, special edition in Fortress. Mm -hmm. Fortress. I, I keep wanting to say Fortress. I I, it's Fortress, like the Fortress, you know, like, uh, but it is Fortress. I know it's, right. it's tricky. But but in 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 Fortress, you did this really interesting thing where where you opened up and and oh and you got that one I love that one because that's a <laughs> solvable maze yeah um, I can show those examples uh, and share the screen with those yeah oh I I'm really happy you got that one I love that one I mean I but, I but like this, a lot. this has the this has the translucent ink. And the translucent yellow ink sort of points the way towards the cover of Environments, which is the newer, newest book and, and the newest edition of the newer book. It's it's true. So um, let me this is open so book right nerdy. I can hardly stand it. Um, so let's see, share the screen, share the screen. OK, so the second book I made is a book about um, Arthur Tress. Uh, he is another photographer from um, from around that. I mean, they're they're both working today. Both these guys, Arthur just turned eighty. Dwayne is eighty nine. They are both still making books and taking photographs, not stopping. Um, but to carry on with like, how do you make something special? Um, when I first released this book. Uh, I had a pre-sale and I said maybe the first 15, I think it was 15 or may maybe 25, probably 15 people who ordered this book, they got a signed um, vintage uh, Arthur Tress postcard. I asked him for some old postcards that he had and he signed them and shipped them to me. 
So that was a way to kind of kick things off. These are two, these are actually this picture and this picture that's the front and the back of the book are you know some of the more recognizable photos of his. So I thought that was a pretty good deal. Um, and then I decided I was going to make a limited edition of this book, which was always the thinking, which was going to be a, a hand drawn and painted in edition. I even chose, again, going back to criteria, the criteria for the paper stock for this book was always a really thick um, uncoated matte paper. So it could absorb and hold ink or, or pencil drawing or something just for a small edition. The whole edition of 500 books was gonna be printed on this just so that like 32 of them I'd be able to draw and print in. So um, I bought these stamps. Uh, I found uh, there's a great place in the East Village where they will make you uh, stamps. And I started using that as a way to kind of uniquely put my signature on it. I don't have like a loopy swirly signature. I just don't have a signature that I enjoy. I usually print out my name in my handwriting, which to me is kind of my signature, but I wanted to put it inside of something so it would look a little a little more unique. So I was well, practicing. The idea of Arthur dreaming Tim, I think is kind of fun. Yeah, I kind of liked that. It was, yeah, especially for a surrealist photographer. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. here were some different ones I came up with. And in the end, I did go with the thought bubble that's kind of coming out of his signature, kind of unifying us uh, in the signing of this book. There are only 32 copies of this book. In the, in the back, uh, here's what differentiates it from the kind of standard edition is this stamp that I used to put the, um, the edition number in there. That's number five of 32. <clears throat> I kind of made up an idea as like, how am I gonna hold these books open while I'm drawing and painting in them? So I got these um, clamps and cut down some wood and just put that in there. And it does a great job of, uh, holding open the book. Um, here's my workspace. I uh, can see I just have things out that I want to use that are easy, inexpensive paint, colored pencils, things like that. And here are some of the examples uh, of some of the books that I was first um, experimenting with. Um, it's torture to make these books, and I'm not even kidding. I used to love drawing as a kid. I mean, I really loved it. Um, and at some point I became self-conscious, which I think happens to most, if not almost, almost everyone. I think that people like drawing and then a lot of times they hit a point where they're like, oh, I can't draw realistically enough or muscles well or whatever it is. And then you get self-conscious and you stop. So every time I have to do one of these, um, it makes me uptight and I got to really like let go of some things in order to do it, but I enjoy that. It makes me, it gets me back to the thing I really love doing. Um, and it's fun. I mean, it's fun and torturous at the same time. Well, and, and on the, on the facing page from the, that remark page is that great uh, conversation with Dwayne. Uh, I mean, not with Dwayne, with, <laughs> with Arthur who says, hi, I will be disappointed if you don't finish the book it would help me get my name out there with all the promotion you do. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes on to say, why are you so afraid of failure? And then he gets, then he gets a little su surprisingly- uh, Body. <laughs> Body, right. Who the fuck cares? Who the fuck are you that you think it has to be perfect all the time? Arthur, the wonder guru, he signs it. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was really good advice from him. So the version, this version of this book is really the fully realized version of this because um, I am doing the thing that I know he's telling me to do, which is like, yeah, draw in that book. You've got 32 of them, draw in every one of them, the 32. If you screw up one, that's life. You've got to live with it, you know, go on to number, you know, 18 after 17 didn't live mm -hmm. up to your expectations. That's mm -hmm. part of it is, is the doing it. In that same way, I found when I was doodling before I would, I would do stuff on this piece of paper and then go to do it again in the book to try and have a dry run, 
they never looked as good as they did on this piece of paper, which made me insane. I'm like, oh, I love all this stuff on here. Why didn't that get into the book? It's like, well, you already did it once. Your brain can't do it like that again. You're uh, mimicking the good thing you just did. You know, so I stopped doing this as part of the process. So um, it did really get me to loosen up. Arthur is such an unselfconscious person that I can do anything with his image and he encourages me to never self-censor my thoughts or something like that. So whatever I want to kind of explore, whatever comes out in my head, you know, this is, this is the way it goes. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed um, making these, <coughs> excuse me, these um, limited books. Oh, there's yours. Oh yeah, there's mine. So yeah, that was a maze and I just was drawing them as lines, but later when it was all done, I'm like, oh, this is actually a maze that works. I think you can go all the way in and out and come back to the start to finish hole there. But um, yeah, but uh, they've been, it's been very fun and liberating. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is the Arthur book. Or I could show a little bit of the Arthur book inside, but what, whatever, what would you like to talk about next? I guess is I'd, I'd, I'd love to see the environments book just okay. because we've shown, you know, your, your collaborative mindset. And I know that you have a very well-developed imagination. I, I wish we had time to go back into the LCD sound system se sequence of your life. But I think oh, if there's, we, if you, <laughs> there's so much, there's another. Too much. Right. Oh, let's, people let's, only have a certain attention span, which I respect. I'm also right. a person. There's only so much we can listen to this guy. I, right. I am, I'm literally so, with you there. Yeah, so let's see environments. Yeah. Okay, so here um, is this book I did um, this past year during the pandemic. Um, the short story to this is, uh, I don't know if any of you have made a book through Blurb before, the online printing service. Um, but they announced that they were having a big sale. It was like 50% off. And uh, I had two days and I thought, you know what? I think I can make an entire book front to back um, in two days. I think I can handle that. So I had a series um, that was called Environments. There are all of these environment shots that usually have like a quirkiness to them or like a little bit of a dry sense of humor or um, something like that, that that appeals to me or that it's the relationship where uh, humankind meets nature in kind of a funny way. This is at the local um, Polish bakery. I love this uh, organic plant that looks like it's at a little shop of horrors or something. Yeah. So I spent um, a day editing all of the photos that I had amassed over, over, I don't know, 15 years. I sent the edit to someone that same day to two or three people and said, hey, this is a greatest hits book. I want you to kill the ones that aren't the greatest hits. They came back with about five or six photos. I looked at the photos, I agreed, those left, and I had whittled down the greatest hits. And, and so they then, had agreed, right? Hadn't they? Uh, yeah, people, people really did, for the most part, choose the same images. And honestly, um, I was on the same page as them. There weren't any that I fought for. I just thought, yeah, they're right. Those are mm -hmm. good, but not great. So I laid out and sequenced the book the next day. It was a Friday. The sale ended at midnight on Friday. Um, I wrote a piece of text that accompanies the book <clears throat> and then had to upload it all before midnight. And I think I got it in at 1136, as I recall. <laughs> so I was pretty happy at making a book you know, a full-fledged book in that amount of time and a book that I was really happy with, especially after the last two books were about other people, although really ultimately they're about me. Um, I wanted a book that was really just my work and the way that I kind of see things when I'm walking around and I have a camera on me. Um, so that's how I, I made this book. Now to sell this book, I thought, okay, I want to make a small run and I have to have it at a certain price point because um, it's expensive to make 25 books through Blurb. You can't really you know, uh, charge very much um, because they cost you a lot of money. So the way that I thought I would get around that was every one of these books from the first 25 in the first edition um, had a different cover that was one of these images. 
So if you got one of those books, um, you had the only book that had that cover on it, which I thought was a unique workaround. You know, I don't know of any other books that have done that where, you know, every, every single book in the run has a different cover. So that's what I did with this, um, with this book. So you uh, to send I'll jump each, ahead. Did you have to send did, in each book separately the one with a different co cover? John, you have asked the most perfect question. <laughs> yes, I had to upload individually those 25 books because you're right, everyone has a different cover. So as I had mentioned to George, what I did one night, which was another was Friday or maybe a Saturday night during the pandemic, so nobody's going anywhere, there's nothing else to do. I have two screens. I put the movie Moneyball for some reason, it just happened to be there on one screen. And then I had me going on the other screen, uploading things meticulously because you have to choose the same end paper. You have to choose yeah. the same paper stock. You know, everything, you can't screw up on one out of the 25. And I was watching Moneyball, which I thought was a pretty good parallel of trying to game the system and come down, make it just to, to statistics and be methodical. And I thought, eh, this is pretty good. Jim, didn't that cost you more money? Because usually you get the discount when you print a large, larger number of the same book. But since each one of yours is unique, you had to pay top dollar for each one, right? Um, you know, that's an excellent, excellent smart thinking question because that was my question too when I saw this discount code. I was like, oh, is this going to apply to only, because I was thinking the same thing, that's smart. The one book or is this for multiples? Is this gonna, you know, again, bite me. But it turned out that it was for any 10 books um, per one email account. So I had to log out after the first 10, log in under a different email account, log out after 10, log into a different email account oh for the God. last five. So oh I, that's a great question because I gave it a lot of thought and, and made it work, you know? Nice. So in the end, this is the book. It's, it's uh, single images on the right-hand page. The numbering system uh, corresponds to what the image number is in case we had to talk about like, oh, I like image number 39 rather than describing it. And we get to the back of the book um, and it had, um, oh, this one doesn't have it. I'll explain why later. On this page, unfortunately you can't see it, was um, a passage that talked about criteria. What's the criteria for making this book and, and really the, and making those photos? And then at the end it said, what do you think is the criteria for this book? I didn't reveal it. I said, what, what do you think the top three you know, criteria is for this book. If you turn the book then upside down, you can see over here on the lower left, there are the answers that I provided. So you switch it like this. And to me, it was like an old, you know, mad magazine or something that I loved growing up that would give you the reveal. You could play along at home was kind of the thinking. I can, I can read them. I have them in front of me. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, number you one. Yes, you could let you could let somebody guess what the criteria. Well, was. that's true. That's true. But anyway, sure. The intersection of where man or man-made things meets nature. Number two, something that is a little dryly funny, a hint incongruous, a little surprise. Number three, surface. Sometimes just the visual texture of different surfaces coming together. Yeah, so those I are the three criteria. I would say every photograph in here fits one of those three criteria. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is actually the second edition, uh, but I'm gonna show you the thing that you asked about earlier, which is um, I just launched a book today in conjunction with this talk. Um, and I'll explain why, um, why I chose to do it today. Let's share this screen. Da, da, da. Okay, so what happened was, um, I got a run of 10 of the books for the second edition, which I had just printed. None of the covers are gonna be the same as the first edition. And I realized they, they had like kind of a slight imperfection to them, the 10 that Blurb sent me. And I wrote them an email and I said, hey, 
these are really good, but like this one's a little off at the top and I was being a little kind of nitpicky, but um, I figured out oh, what the heck. And they said, oh, that's okay. We'll just send you 10 more. And with that, they just mailed me 10 more. Nice. Well, that was great. But now I had these 10 identical <laughs> books that I couldn't do anything with. They're one-off covers. I can't tell somebody you've got this cover and then there's another cover floating around out there. What can I do with these? So um, I thought about this image from uh, Bert Stern when he had uh, this sitting with Marilyn Monroe and either she or he uh, crossed out the, the, um, the chromes that weren't supposed to be used and they left this kind of beautiful streaking through them and later on in Bert Stern's career he decided to make prints of these specific images because they really had an interesting quality to them, the ones that had been X'd out. So I went and got, um, I went to the, the local art store here that uh, I was saying George is a co-op. So it's all artists who work there and bought, uh, I said, look, I wanna paint that's translucent, that's gonna smoothly go on a smooth surface, but also that's gonna cling to a, a slick book cover and not chip off. The guy was like, oh yeah. He's like, you're gonna get this paint <laughs> you're going to get a blank paint marker, which you can put any type of paint into it. And um, then you're going to get this epoxy and mix it half paint, half epoxy, and pour that into the, the paint marker. Amazing. And so that's what I did. I'd first done it in red and did some tests. And the red was a little too loud and obnoxious. And I was like, oh, OK, I won't settle for this. I went back. I got yellow. And yellow, I thought, was a good choice. Um, it's it's nice when it it you know makes a different color uh, when it goes over some of the books. Um, let's see here. I don't know why it's not going to the next slide. Bert Stern. There we go. The, oops. There's another. So there's a finished copy. So these are for sale. Um, my website is uh, theshipescaped.com, um, which is pretty easy to find. Um, but there are only 10 of these. I'm selling five of them and holding on to five copies of my own because uh, I really like them. <laughs> um, I changed something in the second edition. The yeah. first edition, um, I had this text that I talked about finding the criteria and things like that printed on in the book. And then when I came to the second edition, I thought, oh, I can change that up and I'm just gonna print it on yellow paper and make it an insert into the book so that the text will be printed not on the same surface as the photos, which was easy. I printed this on yellow paper on you know, a home computer, but it does kind of add a little bit of class, I think, to mm -hmm. it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I went back to the stamp store, well, they'll make any stamp, and I had them make me an overstock stamp. Now, nobody cares if it's overstock, but I wanted to make a clear distinction that this is not a part of the other editions. Um, and I like the quality that it had. I did some tests with that. Mm -hmm. And so there are some other um, close up images of some of the books uh, that were offered. I tr did try and make different types of X's and things. So even those are uh, kind of unique. Customized. Exactly. So. That's uh, that version. So yeah, yeah. I mean, when you when you mentioned the artist proof, I'm curious about how how that how you sort of designated artist proof within this. I mean, are they all um, APs? I just call this overstock. Like you would go to Ollie's or some discount store and it's just like an overrun of some book that didn't go well. I have some right. co collections in my bookcase where it has, and maybe you, you all do too, where there's maybe a black Sharpie line that's over mm -hmm. the, you, you know, the, the pages at the top, which you'd get at like a discount bookstore or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I chose not to call it like an edition because I didn't want it to kind of compete with the actual editions. Um, and that's the way I handled it. It's right. less expensive because it doesn't come with a print. The other books come with a print. So that's the way I chose to kind of handle the blurb mistake and still get it out there. Plus it was great. Every time there's an opportunity like this, it's awesome to try and figure out a solution of like, what am I gonna do? Like, what's the workaround here? You know? Right. 
well, there was this cool thing that you did insert. I don't know, you, you might, can we stop sharing? And sure, just, let me do that, sure. Yeah. Thanks. There's, there's this little yellow paper um, that had all 25 covers on it. And then this is the one that I have. And you did this amazing script cover, you know, and, and so this is tucked into every one of, uh, I mean, this, there, there are 25 copies of this and, and this one is in my book and someone else's is in that book. It's like bubblegum cards or something, you know, where you're yeah. like, oh, I can see all the others that are out there. I got this one, but what else is out there? You know, no. it's like, oh, I want to collect them all. Well, yeah. sorry, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Please do. So anyway, Mike Hazard is sitting there. Mike, you must have a question here. And I'm, I'm seeing you sitting there and I just think, oh, Mike and, and Tim could have a great conversation. I am enjoying all of the games, Tim Soder. <laughs> oh, good, excellent, that's good. Um, I'm obviously playing my own game by hiding behind the mask. <laughs> fine, that's fine. But Thanks. no, George, if I had any questions, I would have jumped in. Okay, well, I, I'm sorry to call you out then. No, I love it all. I love the way you've uh, entertained your subjects in a kind of give and take collaborative um, play. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the contrast between your work with Arthur Tress and Dwayne Michaels um, speak to the subjects and their characters. It's fun. Mm -hmm. um, I would describe it as a little obsessive. Of um, <laughs> I, I think it's all a little obsessive. Yes, it is, of course. And so it has a, uh, uh, an organic energy that feeds itself. Mm -hmm. No questions, George, but thank you for inviting okay. the conversation. I, I, was, I was just really happy to see you here, Mike. Uh, and I'm happy I, I, I woke up from my nap in time to be here. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. My battery's low. I got to do some other stuff, but I just want to say thank you, Tim. I I have an appreciation for the your unique approach to bookmaking, and it you know it starts and wheels turning with me about you know maybe some future projects too. So I think it's um I I, I like um your techniques and your thinking. Uh, Linda, Linda, you may remember at one point that we talked or that, that I had this idea about putting Polaroids into, into proximities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an idea that Tim would, would get off on. Oh, totally. Right. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, Linda. And I enjoyed seeing your book as well. It was really nice. Yeah. So I'm glad. The we spine did. test. Yeah. It passes the spine test. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks. Okay, Linda. No. Elbrooksphoto.com. <laughs> yeah. All right. Say it, one, say it one more time. Elbrooksphoto. Okay, great. Maybe we can put it in El the Brooks chat photo. in the chat over on the uh, the side. Yeah. Would be good. Okay. Okay. Linda, do you know how to do that? I'm terrible at that. Yeah, I just said I'm a just super just... slow typer. I can just uh, direct message it to you, but let me see if I can pull it up. You said L Brooks. I'm doing it right now. Okay, gotcha. Well, Holly, it's nice to see you. I'm sorry that that the timing got a little a little confused. I know. Sometimes it goes backwards. Like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Where are we anyway? What part of the world are we in? Um, better late than never. Holly, Tim, this is, you know, sure. it was a very good, very good presentation. And it'll be recorded. Okay. Uh, so it, it has been being recorded and I have, I have uh, to figure out how to make that recording available. Um, huge chunk of uh, data. Linda, we, we saw that we saw your in the chat. Yeah, it okay. came up in the chat. Okay. All right. I'm going to take off. Thank you so much, Tim. Nice thanks. to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye, Linda. We'll be in touch. Bye. Okay. Holly, did you have, do you know Tim's work or had you? I don't, I mean, I just read about it in your blurb. So uh -huh. um, 
I don't know. Are you where are you based, Tim? Uh, I'm here in Getting Darker by the Second, Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, we did have some ambient light in the background here, but uh, the window light is fading. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm in Brooklyn, just uh, an hour away, or an hour away timeline-wise, I should say. Yeah. From and and Holly's in uh, the Boston area. Oh, no, right. Western. I'm in Amherst, Northampton That's area. Right. Yeah. yeah, Pioneer Valley. <laughs> Pioneer Valley. Um, but yeah, George, I'm going to pass through Minneapolis um, in oh, August. Good. Will you will you touch base with me, please? Yes, I will. OK, that'd be great. Well, um, uh, we're kind of at a point where I need to stop. Okay. Um, Tim, it's been great. I, I, I knew when we started talking on the phone, I was like, oh, I got to see Tim in person. and. He's going to have, you know, it's going to be a really great conversation. So I'm sorry about all the people who weren't here to see it. Uh, I'm happy to talk. It's fine. It's good. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks for inviting me. Um, Tim, by the way, is a is a uh, pr professor, instructor at Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Um, and you teach bookmaking there. I teach uh, bookmaking over at uh, Center for Book Arts. That's right. Which is, yeah, in Midtown. They've been around for decades. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been good, especially Zoom, you know, reaching a lot more people than might physically able to be there, you know, in the room, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a real treat. Holly, I encourage you to go and look at uh, the ship escaped dot com um, and and look up Tim uh, because the work is really singular and the books are quite amazing. I'm a, George is my new rep. We just yeah. signed on today, which is great. So I'm not going to find better press than this, so I'm going. Yeah, it, you should be able to. Well, I don't know how people do it, but, but yeah, if you can send out the recording, I'll watch it. Yep, I'm You're very I'm, inspiring. Get that out. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Yes. All right. Look, so, uh, next month we have. Um, Oh, we have Sig Harvey of all people. Um, and Sig and I are going to be meeting in Maine and we're going to have an in person discussion about many of her books. So that'll be the next one in the book banter, the photo book banter series. And hopefully, Holly, we'll see you at the right time in, for that one. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thanks, good George. Rest of your day. Thanks, Tim. Thank yep. you. Thanks Thank so you. much, Tim. Thanks. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs> Adios.